In 1905, photographs, not politics, preoccupied Gorski. He stayed true to his small deeds philosophy. But he was quietly working on a revolution of his own. By now, he had established a photographic workshop near St. Isaac's Cathedral. Here he was working on a new technique, pioneered in Europe, three-colour photography. Key to Gorski's success was his expertise in chemistry. This enabled him to develop the right emulsions to coat on glass photographic plates. His ability to find the right chemical formula meant images could be captured and preserved. He continued his trips for the Lavrov works, and this gave Gorski time to perfect his techniques in the field. Every day he took photographs, lots of them, using a modified German-made camera. Through trial and error, he came to his brilliant technique of exposing the plate in the camera three times in rapid succession using a three-colour filter. It was now that he came to the idea of a project to photograph the Russian Empire in colour. Back in St Petersburg, Gorski began to make his name by showing these colour images during public lectures. Again, Gorski showed his flair for adopting new technologies from abroad. He adapted a magic lantern with three light sources. Using a combination of prisms and red, green and blue filters, he was then able to project the black and white positive plates onto a screen in glorious colour. Gorski wanted to make his pictures known throughout the Russian Empire, but for that he needed the support of rich and powerful backers. In 1908 he got his chance when he and friends organised a photography exhibition at the Academy of Arts. The show was attended by the Grand Duke Mikhail Alexandrovich, the brother of Nicholas II. He was impressed and invited Gorski to show his pictures to the Tsar. In 1909, Gorski made the journey from St. Petersburg to Tsarske Selo to meet Nicholas. He knew it was to be the most important day of his life, and he prepared for it with consummate skill. Each image was carefully selected to draw in his special audience. The first was a simple picture of birches, the iconic tree of Russia with a kind of beauty that Tsar could see on his own estate. But Gorski's image had subtle colouring and extraordinary light. It was more like a painting than a photograph. The audience gasped with astonishment and delight. Then came an image of the Dmitrovsky Cathedral in Vladimir, a celebrated jewel of medieval church architecture. Proof in bricks and mortar of the divine mission of the Holy Russian Tsar. Gorski knew things were going well when he saw Nicholas whispering in approval to his wife, the Tsarina Alexandra. Then a wonderful photograph, one that always makes me gasp. A group of children sitting on a hillside by a monastery. How on earth did he get those kids to stay still for the three exposures needed? Or did he? What's that blur in the bottom left-hand corner? Nicholas asked Gorski what he planned to do with his photographs. The photographer said, that he wanted them to be seen by children in all the schools of the empire. Then, he said, they might appreciate the heritage of their glorious motherland. Nicholas was delighted, adding that he would be very pleased if children the same age as his son and heir, the Tsarevich Alexei, could learn about Russia this way. 
the Tsar was persuaded by Gorsky's patriotic purposes and gave his support to a series of journeys, sending the photographer as imperial explorer deep into the Russian Empire. St. Petersburg was an imperial capital. Its guiding principles were those of bureaucrats and military men. Politically, it stood at the centre of a vast multinational empire. But culturally and geographically, it lay on the western extremes of this huge land mass. Vast areas of land in 1900 were still virtually unknown. The Tsar was conscious of the need to integrate his empire, which had been rocked by nationalist protests during 1905. Photography could play a crucial part in creating a new imperial identity, and in Gorsky, the Tsar thought he had found his man. Gorsky was already an active member of the Imperial Geographical Society, which had been formed in 1862 to explore and map the unknown spaces of the Russian Empire. Information was the key to the empire's rule and unity. The Tsars built railways, canals and telegraphs. The camera was an instant means of imperial appropriation. In this power game, to see and catalogue was to conquer. And here at the Imperial Geographical Society, there was a long tradition of photographer-explorers who charted the new lands and peoples of the Tsar. In the library of the society, Gorsky would have found the photographic albums of 19th century photographer-explorers. These were portraits of ethnographic types, catering to a demand for exotic images from an unknown world beyond St. Petersburg. Gorsky would follow in this tradition of photographer-explorers. In the summer of 1909, Gorsky set off on his first assignment. He left St. Petersburg with a permit giving access to restricted areas of the empire and an order from the Tsar commanding help from the notoriously obstructive local bureaucracy. Nicholas provided for a Pullman carriage, fitted out to work as a mobile darkroom, but he didn't advance any cash. Later, Gorsky confessed that he was disappointed by the Emperor's stinginess. But at the time, he had been too polite to ask. Gorsky travelled to the heart of old Russia. He journeyed down the Volga River, the legendary source of Russian culture, stopping off at ancient monastery towns and sites associated with the foundation of the Romanov dynasty. He brought back photographs to show Nicholas at Tsarske Selo. Here on the Volga, he captured images of a way of life that seemed unchanged for centuries past, a reassurance to the Tsar that ancient traditions were still upheld. A peasant woman, modest and respectful. Orthodox monks working in the fields as they had done for centuries. The cycle of the seasons, haymaking. This man was Pinkus Karlinsky, 80 at the time of this photograph. He would have been old enough to have fought in the Crimean War of the 1850s. 
60 years of service to the state, a supervisor of the Chernigov floodgate, Pinker stood as an example of loyalty to the Tsar. And images for Nicholas of Holy Russia and the sacred institution at the spiritual heart of the nation, the Orthodox Church. Gorsky said about these photographs that their purpose was to record the country's cultural heritage. What, he asked, would happen if the frescoes or mosaics on these walls were lost or destroyed? We would never know what colour they had been. This is an image with a special historical significance for any Russian Tsar. A wall of icons, the iconostasis at a church in Baradino, the site near Moscow where the Russians fought the French in 1812. After 1917, the icon would become a proscribed image, hidden by believers, destroyed by Bolsheviks. The Monastery of the Transfiguration on Solovetsky Island, whose hermits were revered by the Romanovs. In 1923, it was turned into a labour camp, the first labour camp in the Soviet Gulag. And this is the Cathedral of the Nativity in the Ipachevsky Monastery. It was closely linked to the Romanovs, whose founder Michal took refuge here on the eve of his election to the throne in 1613. This is the only colour photograph of the cathedral. The building was destroyed in the first decade of Soviet rule. Gorsky travelled thousands of miles further into the empire, well beyond the heartlands of old Russia. These were newly conquered lands. He journeyed south to the Caucasus, which had not been fully mastered, if they ever were at all, until the 1860s. Then into Central Asia, which only came under Russian rule in the 1870s. Gorsky brought back wonders from the Tsar's growing realm. This is the Shakizinde Mosque, a complex of graves and mortuary chapels built for the female descendants of the great medieval ruler Tamburlaine. Gorsky followed in the photographic tradition of imperial explorers who travelled with the Tsar's victorious armies. But it seems to me his photographs are not just of ethnographic types. They are tender, humane portraits of individuals. Couple from Dagestan. A Chinese tea worker, a foreman in the Caucasus. He even has a name, Lao Jin Zhao. A civil servant, more colourful than most. The Tsar saw his multinational empire in terms of a strict racial hierarchy. But Gorsky seems to celebrate the racial intermingling taking place. This is a photograph of Russian settlers in the Caucasus. I think they might have been members of a religious sect, the Dukhobors, driven out of Russia by the Orthodox Church. A group of Jewish children with their teacher in Samarkand. Where has the Tsar placed the Jews at the bottom of the imperial pile? He never hid his hatred of the Jews. Gorsky pictured them with dignity. And finally, the Emir of Bukhara, 
Alim Khan stares at the camera, and Gorski catches the sadness in his eyes. Although ruler in name, he has been stripped of power and is now a vassal of the Tsar. In 1920, when the Red Army arrived in Bukhara, he fled into exile in Afghanistan. Travelling through the empire, Gorski found a country in the midst of rapid social change. A new Russia was emerging, and he caught it in his lens. The mass commercial culture of the towns was brought by the railways to the countryside, transforming villages which only a generation before had been cut off from the wider world. When Gorski arrived to take pictures, he found that the peasants knew all about his cameras. These three girls came from a remote northern village on the Shiksna River near Kiriov. Gorski was approached by their parents, not the other way around. They put their daughters into traditional dress and offered to pay good money for the completed photographs. Gorski travelled to the industrial frontier of the new Russia in the Ural Mountains. He journeyed on the newly completed Trans-Siberian Railway. 6,000 miles of steel and iron linking European Russia to the far east of the empire. The railway was a symbol of Russia's progress a means of uniting and opening it up for the exploitation of its natural resources, the minerals, oil and gold in the vast expanse of Siberia. Wherever he stopped, Gorski took photographs. A view of a massive stone and iron rail bridge across the Kama River near Perm in the Ural. A switchman by the railway line from Ufa to Chelyabinsk. A gleaming new locomotive. In the sidings behind is a carriage thought to be Gorski's mobile darkroom. Moving east from the Urals, he photographed the frontier mining towns, like this one. Tobolsk. In Gorsky's lifetime, millions of peasants from European Russia were migrating to towns like this. In the industrial town of Zlatost, Gorsky photographed three generations of the Kolganov family. The grandfather is in traditional merchant dress, his son in a Russian cap and tunic, but the granddaughter is in European dress, a picture of the social transformation taking place in Russia during Gorsky's lifetime. With his own experience at the Lavrov foundry works, Gorsky surely recognised that industry and technology were Russia's future. Sometimes he seemed to rejoice in the poetry of machines, a feeling that would later be expressed by the futurists and film artists in the Soviet era. But Gorsky also knew the costs of Russia's industrial revolution. Many of the peasants Gorsky photographed ended up in factories like this. Peasant handicrafts and manual methods were transplanted straight into the factory environment. But meanwhile, in the village, these old crafts were dying out as cheaper manufacturers brought in by the railways 
took their place at country fairs. In this picture of a peasant woman spinning yarn, there is, I think, a sense of loss. Gorski photographed these dying crafts. I think he felt a need to catalogue and capture through his art a Russia which he feared was about to pass away. This sense of loss, a nostalgia for the passing of old Russia, was shared by other Petersburg artists and intellectuals. After the 1905 revolution, there was a growing expectation of apocalypse, a sense that St. Petersburg had had its time, that another, more violent revolution was about to sweep away this civilization. Alexander Bloch, the symbolist poet, depicted life in Russia as if living on a volcano. Я вижу над Русью далече широкий и тихий пожар. And over Russia, I see a quiet, far-spreading fire consume all. Nineteen thirteen marked three hundred years of Romanov rule. The iconography of the Jubilee once again played on the myth of old Russia, the holy monarchy, the sacred order, the humble people devoted to their Tsar. The onion domes and bells of Muscovy. The same year of 1913 saw the premiere of the Rite of Spring, a Diaghilev production from the Ballet Russe, Music by Stravinsky, the choreography by Nijinsky. The Rite of Spring drew its inspiration from the art, dance and music of the Russian peasantry. These were the disturbing sounds of a world apart from the European culture of St. Petersburg. In these violent rhythms, one can hear, I think, the terrifying beat of World War I. When the war against Germany began in 1914, Nicholas ordered that St. Petersburg should be known by a Russian name, Petrograd. After a series of military defeats in 1915, Nicholas left the capital to play the part of supreme commander at the front. But neither his divine authority nor the medals he gave out could stop a military catastrophe. Gorsky's eldest son, Dmitri, was fighting for the Tsar. Gorsky himself worked for the Imperial War Ministry, censoring films, teaching pilots how to take photographs, and working away at new photographic advances for the motherland. There was one last trip, travelling north from St. Petersburg, an assignment to photograph the new railway link to the port of Murmansk. During the journey, he posed for a self-portrait. Gorsky, wistful and reflective. A presentiment, perhaps, that his time as photographer to the Tsar was at an end. There would be no more slideshows after dinner at Tsarske Solo. The February Revolution of 1917 came at the end of the third winter of the war, 
born of cold and hunger. The insurrection began on the streets of the capital and then quickly spread to the other cities of the land. Soldiers were refusing to fight for the Tsar. With the whole structure of Tsarist power collapsing, Nicholas's generals urged him to step down. The Tsar's abdication was met with fear by some, but for others, there was joy and expectation that Russia could now arise. This was seen as a national revolution, a popular revolt against the dynasty. Even the peasants, of whom it had been said that they could not live without the Holy Tsar, found cause to celebrate when they discovered that in fact they could survive without him. They now came home from the war for peace and land reform. At the Alexander Palace at Tsarske Selo, Nicholas was placed under house arrest. What had been a playground was now a prison. In the spring of 1917, Gorski gave a series of photographic shows in the Winter Palace, soon to be the seat of the provisional government led by Alexander Kerensky. Gorski called his presentation The Wonders of Photography. The title seems almost surreal against the backdrop of political events. Six months later, the mythic storming of the Winter Palace, the October Revolution, a revolutionary drama played out by the Bolsheviks. In the spring of 1918, the capital was transferred from Petrograd to Moscow, the city that faced not Europe but the East. It was the final act in the collapse of the old imperial civilization. Meanwhile, Gorsky seems to have made an accommodation with the Bolsheviks. He was offered a professorship at a new institute for photography by the Commissar for Enlightenment, Anatoly Lunasharsky, who made a habit of helping old world intellectuals. But that summer, the country was engulfed in civil war and terror. Gorsky's son, Dmitri, fought for the Whites against Trotsky's Red Army. When Nicholas II and his family were murdered by the Bolsheviks in July 1918, Gorsky decided that the time had come to flee. He left his home by the Fontanka River and somehow managed to escape to Norway taking with him several heavy boxes of photographic plates. I suppose he must have had the clearance of Lunasharsky and the Bolsheviks, but how he got it remains a mystery. But Gorsky always seemed to know the right people. From Norway, he went to England and then on to Paris. At some point, he had begun a love affair with his assistant, Maria Fyodorovna. He took her with him when he fled abroad. Their daughter, Helena, was born in 1921. His first wife and children joined him in Paris in 1924. The two families settling down in an uneasy coexistence together in this place of exile for so many Russians. Gorsky set up a photographic firm in the Rue d'Alessia. But once he went into exile, he took no more photographs of note. Russia had been his muse, the Russia he had lost. Gorsky died at the age of 81 
in September 1944. He is buried in the Russian cemetery at Saint-Geneviève-des-Bois. Today, his photographs are found in the Library of Congress in Washington. They have been digitally restored to their original glory and are now available online. Gorski has surpassed his wildest ambition, not just a national, but a worldwide audience. St. Petersburg was the host and the inspiration to an extraordinary renaissance in the arts during the last decades leading up to the revolution of 1917. Poetry, music and the ballet russe, painting and photography. In all these arts, there was a sense that Petersburg was not to last. And perhaps it was from this that the culture of the city derived its extraordinary intensity. Walking around St. Petersburg, one cannot help but feel that the clock stopped here in 1917. This is a nostalgic city, and perhaps it always has been so. But what is Petersburg? but a longing for a universal culture transmuted into stone. Built on marshland reclaimed from the sea, the imperial city lived on the margins of apocalypse until it was swept away in the revolutionary flood. Gorski went with it, a man now long forgotten in St. Petersburg, but his work remains a symbol of the city's huge potential and creative energy in the years before 1917. And that potential is an inspiration to St. Petersburg today. Tomorrow on BBC Four, another chance to see Samuel West as Lord Macaulay, the first of our historians of genius, telling the story of the Monmouth Revolution at 10. But with music next tonight from one of the founding fathers of American mountain music, who's found a new audience through the hit soundtrack to Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Ralph Stanley, live at the Barbican, next. <laughs>